Welcome to the Community Foundation Annual Meeting, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I am incredibly proud to serve as chair of the board for the Greater Washington Community Foundation, and I am especially proud over these past 18 months. Every year, the Community Foundation gives away tens of millions of dollars to organizations and people in need. What I think the Community Foundation does best, really, though, is pulling people and organizations together, working with government and private and public partnerships to help those in need. During COVID, we raised over $11 million that provided 789,000 meals and food boxes to those in need, that helped over 1,000 people access shelter and gave direct cash assistance to over 44,000 people. We also launched an, an initiative in partnership with the National Philanthropies called Get Shift Done DMV that helped over 1,800 displaced hospitality workers who otherwise would have been out of work. And they were paid over a million dollars working with 32 local nonprofits to help distribute meals to those in need. Now I wanna turn it over to our amazing CEO, Tonya Wellens. Tonya took over in March of 2020 literally at the beginning of the pandemic. She has done an amazing job navigating both our organization while everybody immediately went remote and figuring out how do we make sure we're still helping those in need and getting checks cut to our local nonprofits and working with our donors. Um, but Tonya also has just taken the organization and the board through a deep strategic dive focused on what does the community foundation really do best and what do we need to do over the next 10 years to have a real impact? And we have come out of it focusing really exclusively on how do we close the racial wealth gap in this region? And you'll hear more about that down the road. Tonya, over to you. Thank you, Catherine, and many thanks to you and to all of our officers and trustees for your leadership and ongoing support. I remain honored and humbled to be able to lead this organization during such a time as now. And I am so excited about our future and the work we'll get to do together. We've organized a brief but impactful annual meeting for you. So I wanna start by extending a hearty welcome to each of you our fund holders, professional advisors, peers in philanthropy, partners, trustees, friends, and to our staff. Thank you for joining us today. I also want to give a very special thank you to members of the Community Foundation's Professional Advisors Council, whose sponsorship made this event possible. Thank you for giving your time, talent, and treasure in support of the Community Foundation. Today, I will offer a brief look back at where we've been over the last year, and I'll preview where we're going based on our new 10-year strategic framework. I am delighted to host an inter interview with Washington Post columnist and personal finance expert, Michelle Singletary. And we've also organized an investment update with Leslie Jane Dixon, the chair of our investment committee, and Glenn Harris, the Community Foundation's new OCIO. And as we close our meeting, you will have an opportunity to help us select a nonprofit that we'll make a grant to in lieu of the fancy lunch that we might otherwise have. Let's hope that we'll be able to do this in person next year. So let's get started. Catherine shared a few examples of our impact during what we refer to as the trifecta of crises, the global health pandemic, the ensuing economic crisis, and renewed calls for racial and social justice. As the pandemic ensued, the economic conditions worsened. Through partnerships, we galvanized more than 11 million in community, foundation, and corporate support for our coordinated response efforts, which allowed us to serve the needs of over 300,000 people, including providing nearly 800,000 meals we provided cash assistance to over 45,000 people and provided other services from IT supports to PPE to shelter. We managed an additional 30 million in parallel funds established by government 
business and the private donors to respond to this, this area's pressing needs. Philanthropy supported people and nonprofits and small businesses to make it through the darkest of hours. Our community certainly rose to the occasion during this dark period. In the last fiscal year alone, we dispersed over $76 million in grants to more than 7,000 nonprofits. Nearly 70% of those grants supported people and organizations within our geographic footprint. For more than 20 years now, the Greater Washington Community Foundation has served as this community's quarterback in the face of crisis. From the 9-11 attacks on the Pentagon to the current pandemic, it is because of the commitment of our amazing team and community of donors, our philanthropic peers and government, and due to the persistent strength of our neighbors themselves that we are able to weather these storms. And now, we all have an opportunity to lean in even more strategically and with a keener focus to make sure that those who've been hit the hardest by this pandemic those already struggling pr from prior hardship and underinvestment are remembered and restored. This past year, we embarked on a process in partnership with our Board of Trustees to develop a new strategic framework centered around a vision for Greater Washington Region that is equitable, just, and thriving. Not just one that is recovering, but a region where we all prosper together. During this process, our trustees, led by Sean Morris and Artist Hampshire Cowan, along with our advisory boards, fund holders, and staff, journeyed together to chart a path for our collective future. After benchmarking ourselves against community foundations from around the country, asking fund holders, professional advisors, and partners about their aspirations for us and our region, we landed on seven core goals for our 10-year strategic framework. In brief, the goals include the following aspirations. To lead in the community and invest in strategies that close the racial wealth gap and increase economic mobility. To double the assets of the foundation in order to respond to the scope and challenges in order to respond to the scope of the challenges and opportunities at scale. The Board of Trustees will offer exceptional governance and leadership to support the success of our, our plan. The Community Foundation is a fully aligned and united organization serving the entire region, yet we recognize the unique needs and nuances of jurisdictions and neighborhoods. We will center racial equity and inclusion in everything we do. We will work to maximize operational efficiency and offer excellent customer service. And we will powerfully communicate our work and the opportunity to create a more just and equitable Greater Washington region. Our vision for a just, equitable, and thriving community is one where we all prosper, thrive, and flourish. We envision neighborhoods with historically limited access to health care, healing foods and educational opportunities, and communities that have been over-policed and, over and underinvested in will become the subject of our attention and investment. We envision powerful partnerships with community leaders and institutions, philanthropy, the private sector, and government that are fueled by community voice and strengthened with evidence-informed strategies. We'll also support them with long-term commitments and investments. We believe that if we change the prospects for how the most marginalized people generate and sustain wealth, we change every other disparity affecting them, and that this will benefit all of us. So who are the marginalized people and communities in our region? There are nuances be based on geography, but based on the data, black people in our region are faring worst on almost every measure of well-being. 
We also recognize that other communities of color, especially Hispanic and Asian American and Pacific Islanders, are also experiencing hardship. And admittedly, we need to do more to understand indigenous communities in our region. You may hear us reference the commonly used term BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, and is inclusive of all marginalized groups. However, we recognize that there is no one-size-fits-all language when talking about race, and we respect racial and ethnic differences. With that in mind, you will also hear me reference black and brown people when talking about the most marginalized in our community based on the data. To address these crises and build a community in which every person has an opportunity to prosper, thrive, and flourish, we must confront head on this undeniable truth. Systemic racism has relentlessly deprived many of our black and brown neighbors from the same opportunities to prosper and thrive. The good news is that it's not too late for our community to chart a new course. In fact, now is the time for bold action and change. Time and again throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have encountered local and national partners who are eager to partner with the Community Foundation to advance racial justice and increase economic mobility, especially in our region's most underinvested neighborhoods. We've also heard loud and clear the voices from our community calling for swift action to ensure that everyone in greater Washington has an opportunity to prosper. And while advancing racial equity has been a central part of our work at the Community Foundation for many years, we recognize that we haven't always gotten it right and that we institutionally have more work to do. We also recognize that we can do more and we must do more to ensure an equitable recovery from the, COVID, the current COVID-19 crisis, but also from the daily crises impacting so many in our region. The Community Foundation has a historic opportunity to leverage our resources and expertise to lead our community in addressing the most catalytic opportunity of our lifetimes, closing our community's racial wealth gap. Our vision reminds me of my favorite quote on philanthropy from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. While philanthropy is commendable, it must not allow the philanthropists to overlook the economic injustice which makes philanthropy necessary, and I've added, and possible. No doubt, the challenge we face is multifaceted and complex, but the time is past due to address it in ways that are both intentional and aspirational. To that end, our 10-year strategic framework is one that aligns our business with our, our vision, one that is anchored in advancing racial equity and inclusion in, in all aspects of our work, and one that offers a North, a North Star to close the racial wealth gap in our region. How will we lead? Thank you for asking. We'll lead in partnership with the spirit of shared humanity and in bold possibility. The Community Foundation is uniquely positioned to unite our community to take on this challenge. By the nature of our work, we exist at the intersection of racialized wealth and, ra and racialized poverty. To that end, we have built considerable expertise in guiding those with ample resources and charitable aspirations to effectively direct their money and their resources toward helping those in need. Our charitable work is important as is the unique moment for all of us to fully interrogate our own propensities toward charitable solutions rather than sustainable interventions which, cha which challenge systems which aren't working for many communities of color. Ours is the opportunity to invest in upstream possibilities that can propel low-income individuals and communities up the social economic ladder so that they too can enjoy all that this region has to offer. 
Again, the good news is that we already know many of our existing donors and partners and neighbors and countless ones we have yet to meet share in our aspirations. They share in the conviction that we can come together in partnership and as a community to address once and for all the inequities and injustices that have more to do with race than talent or ambition. Together we will work to chart a path forward to shared prosperity. This path will involve moving beyond transactional philanthropy to new opportunities to make a difference. To that end, the Community Foundation is developing new ways for donors to align their philanthropy with the vision of closing our community's racial wealth gap. To join us in our deliberate decision toward multi-year general operating grants and to double down on investments in organizations led by people, led by black, Hispanic, indigenous, and other people of color. We'll also leverage our leadership in relationships developed through decades of ongoing work like putting race on the table and Voices DMV and sharpened through our concentrated work around COVID-19 to focus on creating change at the neighborhood level. So what is the work? Our new strategic framework has three core pillars. One, aligning our business, with, our business with our vision. Two, leading with racial equity and inclusion. And three, closing our community's racial wealth gap. Pillar one, in order to achieve our vision for a more just and equitable region, we are reimagining how the Community Foundation invests in, partners with, and supports our community. We are committed to nearly doubling the Community Foundation's assets over the next 10 years so that we are able to respond to the challenges and opportunities in front of us at scale. Our foundation, amongst its peers, is considered a medium-sized community foundation. And we carry the smallest endowment among community foundations our size in the United States. Our assets are largely held in donor-advised funds, which we offer with pride, knowing that our community of fund holders could find less expensive options for charitable advisory. But fund holders place their assets with us because of our community reach, and commitment, and leadership. Our expanded vision for more robust assets will allow us to be able to even be more responsive to community need and opportunity, and with greater intentionality and agility and resources, invite our donors, peers, and partners to join us on the journey for deeper impact. We will offer a broader mix of products to existing and new fund holders, including funds that are specific to fields of interest and geography. Based on our FY21 giving data, we've observed that at least 22 million in grants through our donor advised funds went to support community and economic development projects, demonstrating that there is already strategic alignment with our new framework. An additional 22 million supported youth and education and about 10 million went to support arts and culture. We believe that organizing communities of givers through giving circles, collaboratives, and co-investment opportunities can lead to more powerful and impactful philanthropy. We're also keen to explore how we can make our infrastructure available to communities of faith, to anchor institutions including hospital centers and healthcare leaders, and to sororities and fraternities, for example, in order to make more powerful our collective philanthropic capacity. Our bold and aspirational vision for this community demands that we establish a legacy for lasting change. That means building an endowment for our community foundation that generates robust discretionary funds to support and sustain our operations and our targeted investments to serve the community today while preparing for the needs tomorrow. Part of this product offering will include endowed memorial funds 
and nonprofit endowment funds. The nonprofit endowment funds will allow community organizations to stabilize their own futures and benefit from the pooled investment opportunities along with us. We view this product as both a capacity building tool and preparation for a rainy day, which many of our nonprofits experienced during this crisis and were completely unprepared for. Our Board of Trustees recently approved the establishment of an endowed crisis response fund that similarly allows us to prepare today for whatever crisis comes in the future. Again, from the unfortunate tragedy of 9-11 to the current global health pandemic, the Community Foundation serving the nation's capital area should always be ready to respond to any hurt, harm, or imminent danger to the people who call this place home. Some of this change is already in motion. Recently, we hired a world-class investment manager, SEI, who shares our commitment to offering a diverse portfolio of investment options, who manages for growth and principal preservation for endowment, who shares our commitment to doing no harm and doing the most good, and who prioritizes diversity among investment managers. Their values align with ours. You'll hear more from our new OCIO later in the program. We have arrived at a moment in which the success and sustainability of the Community Foundation is directly linked to our community's success and sustainability. When we thrive and grow, we are empowered to help our community thrive and grow. Together, we can create the kind of world-class community foundation that this community deserves and continue to serve our region in new and exciting ways. Pillar two, leading with racial equity and inclusion. Philanthropy has a long and complex history in our region. We have a history of investing meaningfully in direct services from safety net services like food and shelter to direct investment in educational support programs and workforce development. Now imagine what's possible when we refocus our work and invest our energy and resources in addressing the root causes that influence historic disparities in income and wealth, education, health, and quality of life in the first place. Can you envision a future where our community social safety net is working optimally and equitably, where all our basic needs are met, where there are no food deserts or disparity in health access, we can. Decades of working in the greater Washington community have shown that many of us are substantially less likely to achieve prosperity simply because we live in neighborhoods that do not provide us with the conditions needed to succeed. And this isn't by coincidence. The legacies of slavery, Jim Crow, and the New Deal, as well as the limited funding and scope of anti-discrimination practices and policies, are some of the biggest contributors to inequality in America. And this is according to a report by the Center for American Progress. It goes on to say that together these policy decisions concentrated workers in chronically undervalued occupations, institutionalized racial disparities in wages, benefits, and perpetuated employment discrimination. And as a result, stark and persistent racial disparities exist in jobs, wages, benefits, and almost every other measure of economic well-being but we can begin to eliminate them and create a healthier and more prosperous community for all of us in Montgomery County, in Prince George's County, in the District of Columbia and in Northern Virginia, if we work to address the root causes behind them and invest deliberately in strategies to address them. That's why the Community Foundation is making a bold commitment. We will lead with racial equity and inclusion in every aspect of our work. In other words, we will center our work, including our grant making and partnerships, our operations, and our leadership around an equity frame that uses 
that requires us to use data as we work with the spirit of shared humanity and in bold possibility. To be clear, this strategic shift pushes us to work at the intersection of issues of race and ethnicity, class, gender, and geography. Pillar three, closing the racial wealth gap. History tells us that our region's racial wealth gap won't close itself. Greater Washington is home to nine of the 20 wealthiest counties in the United States. But families in our community are not equally sharing in this wealth. By almost every measure, education, income, housing, health, or wealth, our communities, black, indigenous, Hispanic, and other people of color are significantly lagging behind their white neighbors. Nationally, the average white family has eight times the amount of wealth as the average black family. And white high school dropouts have more wealth than black college graduates. In Washington, D.C., white households have 81 times more net worth than black households. In Fairfax County, a report suggests that if racial equity gaps were closed, GDP would increase by $26.2 billion a year. Our region isn't unique in facing this challenge. Yet what sets us apart is the stark inequities that have led to some of our, of our nation's wealthiest zip codes being just a short drive from some of the poorest. As home to the nation's capital, and all of the prestige and influence and wealth and power it provides, we can and must do better. Our community needs strong leadership to do the difficult but essential work of identifying the most promising ways to make progress toward closing the gap and then mobilizing resources to support and make it happen. We're working very closely with the Brookings Institution and other research entities to drill down to the level of census track to learn more about the challenges, assets, and histories for neighborhoods experiencing the greatest hardship, but that hold the greatest possibility. We're also exploring and inviting you, especially the wealth management community, to join us as we explore a spectrum of ideas to advance economic mobility and close the racial wealth gap. This includes the downstream work that, our, that we're currently engaging in and ways to make existing systems and investments work better. To midstream investments in efforts like basic income and scholarship and home ownership and portable benefits. But our aim is to really push the boat upstream so that we're investing in baby bonds and debt solution and tax policy that advantages Poor, the poor, and strategic economic participation for impacted communities. We believe that our leadership role is to drive toward a clear and common goal, creating an environment in which every person in our community can reach their full potential, generate wealth, and achieve personal and community success. We invite you to join us. As I close, I extend the invitation to you to join us in many ways. Invest directly in the Community Foundation with an unrestricted multi-year gift and become a champion for your community. Your gift will ensure that we can continue to serve as this community's quarterback in times of acute crisis and as we respond to the daily crisis of people in our region. In order to achieve our vision for this region, we need your investment in our infrastructure. For clients who are interested in making a transformational impact, refer them to us. We aren't the cheapest outfit in town, and we don't see ourselves as competition with the traditional financial management firms. We are a community foundation. Our superpower is knowing this community, connecting the dots, and driving toward impact. We also invite you to join us on a learning journey about race and wealth 
in the greater Washington region and the opportunity to close the gap and increase economic mobility. You can begin by joining us on October 29th for the next installment of our quarterly book group series where we will discuss Michelle Singletary's 10-part series exploring common myths and misperceptions about race and inequality in America. And over the next six months, we will continue our journey to learn and help inform and influence our plan for how we will achieve this vision in partnership with our community. This work requires important and extensive community outreach and listening. So I'll close by reinforcing our belief that opportunity is not a zero-sum game. When we make it possible here for black and brown people to thrive, it will strengthen our community and all of us. And it is through this unleashed opportunity that we can create a more vibrant regional economy and a more resilient community that is fully prepared for the challenges and the beauty that lies ahead. Closing the racial wealth gap stands as a catalytic opportunity to achieve our vision for a just and equitable greater Washington region. Once again, thank you to our sponsors and community champions and everyone who joined us today. We are so excited to have you as part of our community of givers. Thank you. And now, <laughs> it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Michelle Singletary, an award-winning and nationally syndicated personal finance columnist for the Washington Post. Last year, Michelle released a 10-part series called Sincerely Michelle, where she gets personal about misconceptions involving race. Topics range from affirmative action to microaggressions, to redlining. And if you haven't read the series, again, we invite you to join us with our book club discussion beginning on October 29th, which you'll hear more about later. So Michelle hails from Maryland and is a graduate of the University of Maryland College Park. She serves her local community as director of, Pros of the Prosperity Partners Ministry, a financial program she founded at her church, First Baptist Church of Lynn Arden. Michelle also received her master's degree in business and management from Johns Hopkins University. We're so excited to hear from you today. Thank you. So I've had the pleasure of uh, spending time researching you and following <laughs> you over the years um, and most recently studying uh, more about your 10-part series. It was, uh, it's a delightful, delight to have you today. In one of your interviews, you share that a personal shift happened for you during the summer of 2020, following the murder of George Floyd. You note that until, your point, until that point, you'd really reported on personal finance in a race-neutral way, even though you'd had some intense racialized experiences over the years. And that's what you talk about in your series. So um, the series was a bit of a coming out for you. So I'll dive in and really begin to talk about how your ambitions through the pieces connect to our work and uh, where we're going as a foundation. So the first piece in the series, you address affirmative action and the office buzz around your being hired at such a young age at the Washington Post. You ask your editor very pointedly, did you hire me because I'm black? And his answer was yes. Tell us about that period and that time, and especially in a climate now where there's so much focused on REI and DEI in the workplace. Yeah, so when I got to the post, obviously I'm totally excited. Actually, let me back up. I thought your presentation in the moon, it was just so awesome, and I'm just so energized myself. Oh, <laughs> I really, thank you. really was inspired by it. Thank you, Michelle. So when I got to the post, you know, I was really obviously very happy and proud, but there were just whispers and people mm. would come and say, you know, where are you from? And you know, what school you went to? But they weren't trying to get to know me. Mm. They were trying to figure out how I got to the post. Mm. And so I heard all this, you know, talk about it and people would come to me and say, yeah, people are talking about, you know, how you got here. And that's when I asked my editor, did you, you know, after one meeting, and I just couldn't take it anymore. And I just said, did you hire me because I was black? And he said, yes. Mm. And my heart just sank. 
right? Because there's this myth that, you know, blacks take positions just because they're black and they, they're happy to do that. No mm. one wants to take a job that they're not prepared for. Right. And so he invited me into his office. I'm fighting back tears. I'm sitting on the couch. And he says to me, but guess what? I also hired you because you're a woman. I hired mm. you beca because you came from a low-income background. So you understand poverty in a different way than many in the newsroom and the business section don't. I hired you because you have a master's degree. Mm. I hired you because you have an expertise in bankruptcy. Mm. And so I was thinking, well, dude, why don't you start with that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. But he said, Michelle, it is the totality of who you are mm. that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh. And he said, you should never question why you were asked to come join our staff at the Washington mm -hmm. Post. And I, I would like to say that was the last time I questioned my, mm -hmm. you know, my being there, and it wasn't. You know, till this day, and you mm -hmm. think this day. I, you know, I just run a, a, a Gerald Loeb Award, and I still question it because wow. I know when I walk into the door, there are gonna people who think, oh, she got to the post because just because she's black, mm -hmm. and you know that you can see it on their face, you can yeah. see the things that they say. Um, but what he gave me that day was, you know, a. a confidence mm -hmm. that I'm good at what I do and that th th I meant to say this he also said your blackness is an asset mm -hmm. nobody had really ever said that to me right. like that right. that your life experience growing up in inner city Baltimore with a grandmother you know my siblings being you know rescued from foster care mm. that that is an asset and it enriches your coverage here for the post. Mm -hmm. So don't run away from that. And I was like, yeah, power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And I tell you, I just love so much the way you reference your relationship with your grandmother and all of the inspiration that she gave you and yeah. advice that she gave you. Yeah. Um, in the piece around valuing education, you note that rather than admit overt and subconscious bias or discrimination, it's easier for some to accept that there's something missing in the innate character and abilities of tens of thousands of individual black people that contributes to their financial failings. You also talk about shoes and clothes and all of those other things and that you want people to stop comparing uh, black people and other minorities who largely close the racial wealth gap. Black people with other minorities who've closed the racial wealth gap. Would you mind just expounding on that a bit? So, you know, it's very appropriate for your new strategic plan because oftentimes, like, we'll see, for example, on the news, and there's something happening in the black community, and you'll see, you know, lower income people, say, with an iPhone. Yep. And right away, people will go, well, see, that's why we shouldn't give to them. Why do they have an iPhone? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, you can't buy a house with what it costs for an iPhone. Right. You know, and they understand that they want their kids to fit in too. And quite frankly, many of the people who are saying that, they probably can't afford to have an iPhone for their children either. Mm -hmm. And so, so this whole idea that blacks don't aspire to be educated, mm -hmm. or we don't aspire, that we would rather get something from the government, is just really it's just infuriating. Mm -hmm. That mother who might buy those $200 sneakers is just trying to make their child fit in when there's so much else that's going on, mm -hmm. right? That $200 sneakers is not the difference between them paying the rent or sending their child to college. And actually, when you look at the numbers, blacks um, and people of color don't actually spend more on clothes and shoes and iPhones than the rest of America. Mm -hmm. The margin is very slim. And so, you know, this whole idea that we, you know, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstrap mm. and that's where they fail, it's just not true. And they look at people like me right. and they go, well, look at Michelle, she succeeded. Well, I succeeded for all the things that you want to do here at the foundation. I succeeded because my grandmother rescued me from foster care. I succeeded because there was a scholarship program mm. that the Baltimore Sun created to send me to college. And not only that, because I noticed you talked about scholarships, yeah. but you, it's not enough to give a kid money to go to school. You've got to give them mentorship. You have to have a program surrounding that scholarship. Because guess what? If I'm the only one in my family going and there's not a lot of people mm. in my community, there's a lot of pressure. You know, people were like, when I went to college, you would think that people were like, oh, that's great. But there was a lot of talk about, well, you think you're better than me. Mm -hmm. 
And that, how does that work on my psyche? How does that help me succeed in college? I had a scholarship to pay for room, board, and books, but what about living expenses? Mm -hmm. What about the car? I couldn't go home. There were a lot of times I couldn't go home because I didn't have the money for the bus. And if I can't go home and reconnect to my family, now I'm on college by myself on a campus when all my other peers are going home, right. their parents are coming to get them and taking them out shopping. Mm -hmm. I had to buy my own clothes in college and all those kind of things. So when you, it's not enough. It's not to, a level playing field. It's not a level playing field. And then there's the mental problem, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeing all this going on. I can't participate in all of this. And so it's not enough just to give a scholarship. You've got to have a program around that. And I, and I love what you talked about, like multi-year programs and creating a community in which I could succeed. So I had that. I had mentors. I had people. When I graduated, I've only rented one year in my life. I've been a homeowner since I was about 22 years oh, wow. old because of a first-time home buyers program, right, that gave me money to buy a home in my own community. And what did I do with that when I was able to get a home at such a young age? Then I was able to keep a lot of my resources because my rent wasn't always going up. I could take care of my disabled brother. So I had a place for him. He came to live with me. I lifted us up. So it's the totality of these programs that makes a difference. You mentioned in one of the articles um, about home ownership and the valuation of um, of properties that are in black neighborhoods yeah. and properties that are in non-black neighborhoods. We didn't, that wasn't one of our prep planned questions, but I know that you have a lot to say about that. I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot to say about a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, my husband and I wanted to live in our own community, um, and we bought a house in Prince George's community, uh, uh, Prince George's County. We actually looked at Montgomery County because, you know, better schools and things like that, but we could not afford those houses there. We could afford a house in Prince George's County, and it was closer to my church. Yeah. If you picked my house up and moved it to Montgomery County, it'd be probably worth 30 or 40 percent more. Wow. So when we talk about those statistics of wealth, the difference between black wealth and wealth, white wealth, we frame it as if somehow blacks are not handling their money well. Mm -hmm. So we look at that number and it's like people think, oh, that's cash in the bank or investments, when actually it's equity, right. you know, home equity. So. If their houses appreciate more than ours, mm -hmm. same house, you know, same structure. I got ducks in my neighborhood, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. and deer right outside my window. But same house, a white ho homeowner houses appreciate at a greater rate. Their wealth is creating. Mine is stagnant. Right. That is where the difference comes. And why is my stagnant? Because of redlining. And white families don't want to move into my community. Why don't they want to move into my community and be my neighbors because of the color of my skin? Because they think, oh, well, there's going to be crime and I'm not going to be able to sell at the same rate. And so it's sort of like a chicken egg thing. And, and so home ownership is so important mm -hmm. because even though our homes don't appreciate, it does stabilize neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And, and I might, I'm not pulling that equity out of my home, but because I have a home, there are people in my family that have a home. My husband and I have always had people come live with us right. who are you know, not doing as well so that we can lift them up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for uh, expounding on that. Um, talk about, if you wouldn't mind, some of the structural challenges that individuals are having or just can't overcome because of systemic issues, some of the systemic issues of racism that I mentioned in my, in my remarks. But can you talk about other systemic issues in addition to redlining? So we talked about um, uh, employment discrimination for mm -hmm. one. We know the studies, when you look at two black, you know, the groups have done this, right? They have a sample resume, white, black, same, you know, uh, work history, mm -hmm. they go in for a job interview, guess who gets called back? Mm -hmm. Not the black candidate, not the black job candidate. And that still exists. When we do get a job, we are paid less. Um, and, and that creates the wealth def, uh, disparity. So if you're paid less, right. you're not moving up the same way. There's not as much room in your budget to invest and do the things that creates wealth for yourself. Now, you know, I'm saying all this, and I don't want anyone, you know, mm -hmm. to feel like guilty. Right. But the fact of the matter is, racism, slavery, 
still impacts us today. Mm. We know from history that they segregated us in communities, and when they segregated us in the communities, they didn't put jobs there. They didn't put transportation. In fact, in many communities, they built roads around us and, and, and highways that separated us from the ability to get to the jobs. Mm -hmm. And so then you created these pocket ghettos. Let's just call them what they were. Right. And, and then they said you can't move into these other neighborhoods. So you had crowding all these people right. in this place that doesn't have you know, adequate food sources, doesn't have jobs, doesn't have community services. What then happens? This is what creates the crime rate and psychological issues. Now remember, we're coming from slavery. Our families were separated. Right. There wasn't this social safety net, family mm -hmm. net. And when you compare us to other minorities, that is the difference. Right. When Asians came, they didn't separate. They didn't sell off their family. Right. Right? We were sold off. We don't know who we belong to. Mm -hmm. And then you, it's like putting crabs in a pot. And then they're trying to climb out, and then you, 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 you fuss at the crabs right. for, for grabbing at each other. Well, you put us in the pot, mm. <laughs> and then turn up the heat. <laughs> right. you know? And so you've got to understand the psychological damage that our families went mm -hmm. through. I mean, we know when there's alcoholism and sexual abuse in families, it takes generations right. to get that out. So now you have a whole millions of people came out of slavery being beaten and separated, and and. And, and murdered, and you put them in these segregated communities, you don't give them help and mm -hmm. psychological care, and you say, well, you know what, rise up. Right, the compounding effect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's now right. I say that not to say that there's no personal responsibility. I'm right. very much about personal responsibility, but you gotta understand why this is happening yeah. as you try to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was one other question I wanted to make sure we had uh, we had time to I ask. Know I talk to you. No, no, you don't. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, you in your after your ten part series, you did a piece around all of the uh, hate mail that you received for bringing up uh, the issue around race and wealth. And I even share with you um, that as we were going through our strategic plan, you know, there was some concern raised. Like, is this going to is this kind of plan going to put people off? or will it invite people in? But would you mind talking about some of the microaggressions and the hate mail that you received as a result of bringing up the issue of race and, um, and wealth? Yeah, you would like to think in 2021 that some of that doesn't exist. And we think of it in terms of overload KKK and the extremists. But a lot of the hate mail I got weren't from people like that. Because see, you can see that coming. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can get that. But people will say things like, "Well, you if you if you you know if you were in a hut back in Africa, you're mm -hmm. better and you were better a slave." One email actually said, "You were better a slave oh, wow. than if you were a hut in Africa." <laughs> Not recognizing all the colonialism that destroyed so many of right. African countries. I mean, there's no historical perspective about this. That's right. I got an email recently. <laughs> from a white reader that said, I'm a pretty blonde white woman and I'm discriminated against all the time and that's the same oh. as racial discrimination. That's too bad. I can't cuss. <laughs> <laughs> this is a professional word. But that's the kind of stuff you get and you put in your social mm. psyche, right? right? But I have to say, which is why I think that you should be encouraged by your strategic mission, that overwhelmingly what happened from that series is that white Americans, white readers said, you know what, I never thought about it like that. Mm. When I wrote about reparations, which is a hot button issue, right? You talk about reparations and black people, oh my goodness. But I wrote a story about my great, great, great grandmother who was enslaved um, and the, 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 why I think reparations applies. Um, do I have time to tell a quick story? You do, please. So uh, her name was Leah Drumright. She was enslaved. And she worked in the big house. She was, and she was a wet nurse. So she mm. nursed a white woman's owner's baby. And at the, she had a baby at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the white owner, female owner, said to my great-great-grandmother that you can only breastfeed your child on your right breast. Uh. And you can only breastfeed my child on the left breast because that's closer to the heart and mm. that milk is better. Wow. And she couldn't switch them up. 
But one night, working in the kitchen, and these are stories that were passed down from my family. My grandmother told me this. One night, Leah, so exhausted, was nursing her own child on her own left breast. The white owner came in, her owner came in, and she uh, slapped her and then beat her oh my. for breastfeeding her own child. Right. So that's what reparation is about. So she took away, it's the ability to feed her own child, mm -hmm. took away our ability to earn. Why are so many black men in prison? Because there was a point in history where they would round up black men mm -hmm. to send them to jail so they could work on the farms that they were uh, freed from. And so there then became a history of putting blacks in jail because then they could farm them out without paying them to white farm owners and, and businesses. Mm. So when you look at the history, and you have to look at that, that gives you a different perspective about why there's so much crime in the black community. Mm. doesn't mm. excuse people. But once you know it and put it in perspective, it makes a difference. And so that reparations. And so, but, but as I explained it like that, mm -hmm. I was getting feedback, but like I didn't think about it that way. When I wrote about microaggressions, the things that people say, like, and you probably experienced mm -hmm. this, oh, you speak so well. Yep. <laughs> but the last part of that sentence is for Boy. a black person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't say it. Yeah. That's microaggression. Yeah. I have a subscription to Arena Stage, and one <laughs> there was a multiracial uh, production of Oklahoma, which I love. My husband and I love theater. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the front row. We have a premium subscription. I save my money. We love the theater. We want to have great seats, yeah. and we're sitting in the front rows. At intermission, a white woman comes down to me. She leans over and she says, "Oh my gosh, you must know. How did you get these seats? You must know someone in the production." Mm. There was a white person sitting on my, this side and a white person sitting on the side. And I, why would you ask me that? Like, I can't afford these seats on my own. And my husband, ever so, <laughs> the peacemaker, he just puts his hand on me. He says, let it go. Mm. But what you're saying with what you guys want to do is we can no longer right. let it go. We can no longer ignore it. We can no longer yeah. ignore it. And we have to use our philanthropy differently. We do. And I think that people will embrace it yeah. if you put things in perspective. So now every time you mention that wealth statistic, yeah. followed by that should be that most of that has represents home equity. Right. And that home equity was built because when the GIs came back, when, when the, the servicemen came back, there was a GI bill. Right. Who got the proceeds from that? The white uh, service members, but not the black. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that when we use these statistics, we put it in historical in uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think then donors will see, ah. And because that's what we did with the series, people right. responded with, oh, I get it mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I get it now. Mm -hmm. And that is what you want, why this matters. Right. Because if I'm doing well, if my people are doing well, you're going to do We're well. We're all going to do We're well. We're all going to do well. <laughs> so if you don't want to do it because it's the right thing to do, just know that it's good for the country. Right. Less, you know, we, we don't have to rely on the social net as much. We don't, mm -hmm. maybe our taxes would go down and you right. know. That's right. <laughs> You know, We're all looking for ways. We all look for ways with that. So uh, that's why this is so important, mm -hmm. right? It it's it, it's we've got to we can't let this stuff go any longer. This has been has been an amazing conversation. I really really appreciate Thank the opportunity. You. Uh, you are so passionate about your work. <laughs> uh, it is lighting a fire. I hope for our audiences yeah. and certainly for me. And I know that the team at the Community Foundation. Um, thank you very much. You're so welcome. I really, really appreciate it. I do believe in this mission. Thank and you. And I hope you don't lose anyone because I'm just the Michelle Singletary, but there are so many other Michelle Singletary who didn't get what I got. Mm -hmm. And I want that for them. And I know that your people do too. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. So no, no, this is, this is amazing. So I appreciate it. Great. So thank you, everyone. Um, this meeting is not only for the Community Foundation's donors and, and partners, but it's to really to spark conversations um, like this one for the broader community. Um, so now we are about to transition in the program. Um, we've outlined our vision, and Michelle has 
placed a bright spotlight on where we're going as a foundation. And now you get to hear some perspectives from our community about why and how we got here. Um, to help this conversation, to help advance this conversation, to what our advisor partners can help do with their clients, we've invited our newest trustee, Sarah Moore Johnson from Berkstone Moore, to share her perspective. Sarah is a highly regarded estate planning attorney in the region and immediate past president of the Washington, D.C. Estate Planning Council. After we hear from Sarah, I've asked Sean Morris of the Community Foundation's trustees, and who was also the co-chair of our Strategic Planning Committee. He currently serves as COO of government, Relation, government and Public Services at Deloitte to talk about how we arrived at the decision to focus on equity. So now we'll transition and invite Sarah to the table. Thank you, Tonya and Michelle. As we've mentioned, today's meeting is not only for the Community Foundation's donors and partners, but it's also for the professional advisor community, the estate planning attorneys, accountants, insurance, and financial advisors who connect their philanthropically minded clients with the Community Foundation. As Tonya mentioned, I am an estate planning attorney who represents high net worth clients. I'm also a Southerner. When I was growing up, I witnessed racism in ways big and small. 
some of which Michelle has addressed. And I was disturbed by it, for sure. But I think that I felt that it was the adult's job to do something about it. And if the adults wouldn't do anything, then how could I? But at some point in life, I've realized, you look around and you realize you are the adult. And if you don't take action, no one else will. So in the summer of 2020, three weeks after the murder of George Floyd, I was installed as president of the Washington, D.C. Estate Planning Council, an organization that was 94% white. And I decided that it was on me to act. My first efforts were focused on increasing diversity in our profession. But as I drilled down, I learned more about the racial wealth gap that Tony and Michelle have discussed and how the work that I do every day actually contributes to racial wealth disparity. As professional advisors to wealthy clients, we are at our best when we help our clients save taxes, earn a higher rate of return on their investments, and plan for liquidity to transfer businesses at death, all in a manner that promotes family harmony rather than creating strife. But when we do this work for mostly white clients, we are worsening the economic divide in our country. Not only is that bad for the people at the other end of the wealth chasm, but it's also led to political instability how bad is the racial wealth gap? Well, that's been discussed today. We know it's pretty terrible. One thing that's worth mentioning is that the racial wealth gap persists at all socioeconomic levels. If you took, for example, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, and Kanye West, three of the top five uh, black Americans who are in the billionaires club, and put them in the same room with Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates, they would find that the white billionaires in the room had 50 times greater wealth than them. Why is this the case? We've discussed, and our hearts know it. It goes back to slavery and the century of racist governmental policies that followed, particularly with respect to housing and education. But all hope is not lost. We can leave here today and go back to work resolved to do something. There are three ways that you can have an impact on repairing the racial wealth gap. First is to promote diversity in our professions. Second is to seek out and advise black and brown clients. And third is to reconsider the tax and financial policies that drive us to do what we do. Interestingly, inheritance, or the lack thereof, is one of the primary drivers of the racial wealth gap. White Americans are three times more likely to receive an inheritance than black Americans. And inheritance just happens to be our specialty as estate planners. But if black and brown Americans are underrepresenting and underrepresented in our profession, those communities are far less likely to seek out our advice and assistance. Black and Latinx groups make up more than 30% of the country's population. Yet of the more than 80,000 certified financial planners in the United States, only 3.5% are black or Latino. The American College of Trust and Estates Council is an organization for the best and brightest estate planning attorneys in the world. It has 2,500 fellows, and only six of them are black. I encourage each of you to consider your hiring practices and how you can create opportunities for people of color. You can organize or join existing pipeline programs that seek out and place students of color in internships and jobs in the estate planning profession. Your firm's name and reputation can be a stepping stone for young people of color. Having a Northwestern Mutual or Bank of America on their resume can open doors that lead to a long and lucrative career. Once you've hired a person of color, mentor them and sponsor them. As Michelle so emotionally discussed, don't assume that because they've gotten their foot in the door, it's now a level playing field, because it is not. Give your black and brown employees extra training, extra attention, sponsor and promote them in any way you can. Second, we should all look at our client base. How many clients of color do you have? If less than 30% of your clients are people of color, then you have work to do, and so do I. How do you seek out clients of color? First, if you're approached by a potential client of color, accept them, even if they don't meet your minimum or your typical client profile. Do a good job for that person and ask for referrals to the high net worth people in that person's professional and social circles. My first black client was a businessman who was introduced to me by someone at my former firm. That client introduced me to the pastor of his church, who had a $30 million life insurance policy and no estate planning. The pastor then introduced me to other doctors and professionals in the congregation, and I built a reputation as someone the community could trust. Talk to black and brown people in your network and let them know you'd like to increase your client base in their communities. Be honest and let them know that you're motivated by a desire to repair the racial wealth gap. If you don't have any people of color in your network, 
start following diversity and racial equity hashtags on LinkedIn. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that before long, your social media feed will be filled with black professionals you can network with. Once you have a client of color, give them a complete checkup. One of the most important things you can do is check the interest rate on their home mortgage loan. Predatory lending practices are still a problem even for wealthy people of color. I often find that my black client's interest rate is at least twice what it should be. Introduce them to a trustworthy lender, as well as a financial advisor, an estate planner, or an insurance advisor if they don't already have one. And last but not least, we are all people in positions of influence and power. Consider how you can affect our tax and financial policies to promote racial equity. If you go back to the inception of our country, our founding fathers, in particular Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, rejected European aristocracy in favor of equitability of wealth, a notion of relative equality and fairness. The last time our country experienced a wealth divide like the one we have today was during the Gilded Age at the turn of the 20th century. By the time Theodore Roosevelt became president, he and the country were so fed up with the robber baron ruling class, he recognized that the divide between the haves and have-nots was a threat to democracy. So what did President Roosevelt do? He implemented an estate tax. His aim was redistributing, in his words, those fortunes swollen beyond all healthy limits. Today, the estate tax has become what one scholar calls a zombie tax appropriate for Halloween. It walks around scaring people, but does little else to raise revenue. But for a long time, the estate tax served its purpose of wealth containment and the prevention of an aristocratic ruling class. From 1941 to 1976, the top estate tax rate was 77%, and the exemptions were only $40,000 to $60,000 during that time. I know my clients may not want me to say this, but as a country, we should remember our roots when it comes to tax policy and cheerfully embrace an estate tax that levels the playing field. The policy argument is not just about estate tax. There are many other things you can do to help. You can lobby to include timely rent payment and utility payments in credit score reporting to help boost the credit worthiness of black and brown people. Access to credit opens doors, as we know, to opportunity for home ownership, student loans, and starting a business, all things that help people build equity and wealth. You can lobby our local jurisdictions to pass the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, which makes it easier to gain legal title to homes that were received through inheritance, but that were never properly probated because of perhaps a reluctance or a financial inability to hire a lawyer. Until then, you can do pro bono work to help heirs obtain proper title to their family homes through probating their old estates. This helps preserve affordable housing and stems the tide of displacement of longtime black district residents and enables homeowners of color in the district to build generational wealth. And last but not least, you can help promote the Community Foundation in its mission, which I am so excited about, to create a thriving, prosperous, greater Washington, DC. If your clients want to make an impact, introduce them to the Community Foundation. They can make a difference whether via a charitable gift or contributing to a donor advised fund. And there will be opportunities for you, the advisors in the audience, to participate in a learning journey with the Community Foundation this year, starting with the book club on October 29th. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I hope you all are all as excited as I am to help the Community Foundation in its new mission. Thank you. Really pleased to be here with all of you today to tell you a little bit about the Greater Washington Community Foundation's new strategy. Before I get started, I want to take just a moment to recognize my co-lead, Artis Cowan, who is a fantastic partner in this entire process. So I've made a few strategies over the years. And I'll tell you, there is a common set of ingredients that goes into a great strategy. And the first one is, is that you should use an outside independent third party. And we did that in this instance. And the great news is, is that she actually specializes in community foundations across the country. So we got a lot of really rich and great content from her. The second is you need to hear from a diverse set of stakeholders. And we did that. And then the third is, is that at the end of the day, you're trying to boil down all of this data, all of this input, all of this information into a set of key priorities. 
And I believe we've got a set of key priorities from which the Community Foundation can continue to grow over the next couple of years. So a couple of key points on what this strategy is. It builds on an almost 50 year heritage of the Community Foundation having an impact that matters. And it recognizes the convening power of the Community Foundation in the greater Washington area. And thirdly, a departure maybe from other strategies that you may have seen from us in the past, this doubles down on equity. So why are we doubling down on equity? Well, here's a couple of key facts for you. Despite the fact that we're arguably the most powerful city in the world, and these are the facts, we're one of the wealthiest areas in America, not all communities have grown and prospered at the same levels and speed. Said another very specific way, black and brown communities in our DC metro area have lagged behind significantly white communities. And so this focus on equity is all about trying to rectify that particular trend that we've all seen. And we saw that trend very starkly during the pandemic. Black and brown communities were affected far worse than other communities. So I'm incredibly proud of this strategy. I know Artists is as well. Uh, we look forward to answering lots of questions from you on it, but we believe that the Community Foundation has a strategy that will continue that heritage of having an impact in those communities that need it the most. The last thing I'll say on this is this has been a great personal journey for me. If Artis were here, she would very articulately tell you that we're all on our own personal journey around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this was certainly a very rich journey for me. And thank you to everyone on today's call for joining us to hear about the Greater Washington Community Foundation's exciting partnership with SCI. An update on performance and a brief peek at a few new donor fund offerings. My name is Leslie Jane Dixon, and I serve as the current chair of the investment committee. At the Greater Washington Community Foundation, we continuously seek out new ways to amplify your giving by preserving and growing your fund through a focus on maximizing returns while minimizing risk and volatility. This philosophy dovetails perfectly with the mission of our partner, SEI Investments. Today, I'd like to discuss why the Community Foundation decided to move to an outsourced CIO model, why we chose SCI, and some of the benefits we expect from this new relationship. An outsourced Chief Investment Officer, or OCIO, is a model of investment management that involves an external advisor or manager having delegated authority to allocate capital within an institution's portfolio within a set of policy parameters approved by the institution. In making this change, we moved from a model where the committee shared decision-making responsibility with the advisor to one where we delegated that responsibility to SCI. Why SCI? After a lengthy and robust search process, SEI was selected because the Community Foundation felt that this firm, its process and mission best aligned with our long-term vision for the investment of our assets, that they would act as an extension of our team. They demonstrated a commitment to innovation and had a culture based on integrity and collaboration. What do we hope to gain from this move? Partnering with a seasoned OCIO brings many benefits, including enhanced performance potential, a comprehensive portfolio management, a robust governance process, back office support, potentially lower fees due to scale, responsiveness to fast moving markets and in-depth reporting. The appeal of the OCIO model is that it allows the investment committee to focus on investment objectives, 
risk tolerance, and how the assets integrate with the mission and strategy of the foundation, while leaving the day-to-day -day advisory responsibilities in the hands of the investment advisory firm. <clears throat> Beyond the business benefits I just described, the investment committee, working in conjunction with SCI, has been reviewing the investments within and outside of the combined investment fund, giving attention to improving diversity and sustainability among our current holdings to ensure that we work towards investing in funds that align with our core values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as our OCIO, Glenn Harris, will show during his presentation, our current investment lineup already scores high in these areas. In short, our goal is to uncover new ways to empower donors to tie their investing to their values. So in addition to the changes made by the investment committee and SCI, the Community Foundation will be unveiling new donor giving opportunities in two broad areas. Funds that secure our future, such as crisis response, and funds that focus on investing in a just and equitable region, such as field of interest. These options, along with the Fund for Greater Washington, will provide donors with multiple ways to deepen their impact in our region. Please stay tuned for more information on these giving opportunities in the future. We have confidence in SCI's commitment to the success and goal of your fund with the Greater Washington Community Foundation and look forward to establishing a long-term prosperous relationship for the benefit of our community and the causes that are important to you. Now, let me turn it over to Glenn Harris, our OCIO, to tell you more about SCI, update you on recent performance, and our diversity support. Glenn? Hello, and thank you, Leslie Jane, for that introduction. Um, I plan on talking a little bit about SCI. I'm sure many of you may or may not be familiar with the organization. And then as Leslie Jane noted, talk a little bit more about the investment options. So hopefully on your exhibits right now, you can see a little more of an overview about who SEI is. So SEI is actually one of the largest uh, global outsourced chief investment officers uh, in the world. And you can see here that we've been doing this for now well over 25 years. Uh, we've actually uh, tacked on a few more nonprofit clients. We have over 180 clients now representing about $34 billion on behalf of uh, all of SEI's assets. We are actually a global firm, as I noted. You know, we trade on the NASDAQ, our symbol is SEIC, and you can see we make annual investments in our business. And I think probably the most important thing that I'd like to highlight too is that all of our 3,000 employees are actively involved in various community causes. You can see here, they span everything from our own CARES Foundation to a green environmental team, to the Women's Network Wellness Team, Diversity Team, as well as supporting our military. So as far as the investment options are concerned, um, you know, the first thing I would say is that they cover a lot of different uh, areas. So we've got everything from something that's very conservative, like investing in cash or money market funds, to the combined investment fund, to a number of Vanguard index funds that were offered starting in 2017. And then finally, a special purpose fund, which is the Enterprise Community Loan Fund. So talk a little bit more about them in detail now. The first thing I would say is in regards to cash, these are gonna be your most conservative options. And so the options here are going to typically offer donors uh, the ability to put their money to work in the short term. Uh, so if you think about where we are currently in the market cycle, uh, these types of funds unfortunately are offering very, very low yields and they have for quite some time now. But at the same token, they also offer the lowest amount of risk. You know, as far as the index funds are concerned, similarly with a money market fund or short-term treasury index fund, these two are also considered uh, lower risk investments. But I would also point out the fact that the big difference here is the maturity of the underlying securities in these two types of funds. Or another way of saying that is what's the duration? You know, what's the sensitivity to changes interest rates? For quite a long time, now interest rates have been very low. Inflation is starting to rise that starts to present other types of risk. Um, but I would say here, again, these are types of funds for donors that wish to put those money, 
uh, to work in a, in a much sooner fashion. Whereas if you're willing to take a little bit more risk in terms of looking for more income or more yield, that would be the total bond market index. And so this is a fund that's quite different in the sense that you have exposure to more than 10,000 underlying securities here that are considered an investment grade here in the United States. Uh, but you're also exposing yourself to more interest rate risk, right? Because the maturity is no longer 60 days or two years, but now you're talking about bonds that mature closer to eight or nine years. And then lastly, uh, you know, it's considered the benchmark here in the United States is the S&P 500 index fund. So this represents the largest companies in the United States. And what's interesting about the S&P 500 index is currently, you know, the top 10 companies in that index represent almost 30% of the index. So it's a market cap weighted index. So companies like Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, they represent the largest holdings in that index right now. And not surprising, these are the types of stocks that have done very well uh, over the last decade. Whereas the combined investment fund, this is gonna be what I would say is gonna have the greatest impact for investors that are focused more on the long term. Why that is, it's gonna be the most diversified. You're gonna have exposure to all different types of equities, both in the United States, as well as outside the United States, as well as other types of fixed income uh, investments also. And the other thing I would say too about this slide in front of you is, you know, besides the combined investment fund, there's also special purpose funds that Leslie Jane was talking about. And here we have the Enterprise Community Loan Fund. This is not managed by SEI, but this is a type of targeted investment where if you were participating in last year's annual meeting, you might've heard the fund managers talking about uh, their latest investments with respect to uh, affordable housing. Um, and so typically these types of loans are going to be anywhere between one and 10 years. They're gonna offer yields between maybe a half percent to 3%. But really the main reason why investors will select a fund like this is because you wanna make the largest impact in terms of specifically targeting a theme. And more recently, it's been affordable housing. I guess my last comment about this page too is the fact that those fund holders that are um, you know, willing to have or work with their own financial advisor, you can actually select um, the option of investing approximately $500,000 or more to work with your own financial advisor and those funds would be obviously part of the uh, community foundation as well. This slide here, this kind of summarizes what I was just talking on the previous page, and that is, you know, what is the trade-off in terms of how much risk and how much return you could potentially expect from all those funds I was just describing? And, and not surprising, at the bottom left-hand side, you can see that uh, cash typically is gonna offer the lowest amount in terms of return, but at the same time, it's gonna have the lowest amount of risk. Whereas you work your way up going towards the right-hand side, not surprising, equities, of course, uh, but we're gonna provide you with the, the most amount of return, typically over a longer time horizon, but certainly come with considerable more risk. And that's why if you look sort of in the middle there, you can see the Community Foundation's Combined Investment Fund, which incorporates both stocks and bonds, and therefore the risk-return trade-off um, is quite different than being solely in bonds or solely in equities. So I'm sure you're all probably curious to know about how have these investments been doing. And so you can see on this slide that we're providing you with the one-year, three-year, five-year, 10-year annualized returns, and then the year-to-date, which is a cumulative return. So from January 1st through the end of 930 of this year. And what's really interesting is if you look at the conservative options, these are gonna be the smallest bars uh, where the returns are nearly 0% uh, so far over the last year or so. But when you start even going out further, three years, five years, 10 years, those returns are still very minimal. And that's a reflection of where we've been in the market cycle. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about interest rate risk and inflation risk, right? So you're not really achieving a great amount of return. But again, the key point here is those investments are designed for spending those assets in a shorter time horizon. Where you look at the other options, the Common Investment Fund or the S&P 500 Index, you can see that even despite coming out of a pandemic from March of last year, the returns have been quite generous in, with a diversified portfolio uh, or even the S&P 500 Index. And you can see longer term, again, focusing on the longer term, five years, 10 years, you can see the returns have been quite high 
uh, for, for both of these types of strategies. I guess the last thing I'll conclude with is manager diversity. I know there's a lot of information here on your screens, but as Leslie Jane was saying earlier, you know, one of the reasons why SCI was selected was our commitment to hiring and employing and investing with managers that have more females at the organization, as well as more people of color. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, it's showing you that all of the underlying managers that are in the combined investment fund, some up to approximately 70%, uh, so a combination of women and people of color that are managing the assets within the combined investment fund. And that's something that SCI is committed to, making sure that we have more diversity in our manager lineup. And then I guess the last point I would make here too is the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. So SCI is one of the organizations that has signed that agreement, making sure that our investment process ties back to those UN goals. In summary, you know, I would say that uh, looking forward, you know, our goal will be to continue to focus on diversity, as well as working with the Community Foundation's Investment Committee to ensure that we have a lot more options available for the fund holders. So I thank you for your time today. And of course, thank you for your investment in the Community Foundation. It's my pleasure to bring our annual meeting to a close. And what an exciting meeting it was. I hope you're as excited as I am about the future of the Community Foundation and our community. If you have questions, please email us. Uh, we will be following up and we will answer each of your questions. I have the pleasure of bringing this to a close in the absolute best possible way, which is to celebrate your generosity. Uh, as you saw at the beginning of this meeting, uh, we invited you to vote on a nonprofit that would receive a grant in lieu of the lunch that we did not provide, as Tonya mentioned at the beginning. And we were taking bidding, and uh, you decided to uh, take up that challenge. And I am so excited to share that we have received support for all four of the nonprofits that we uh, invited you to bid on. The Community Foundation grant is going to go to Bread for the City. I'm very pleased to share that uh, Trustee Charlene Dukes is making a grant to the Capital Area Food Bank. Uh, Trustee David Schifrin and his wife Peggy are making a $2,500 grant to United Communities Against Poverty. And Sarah Johnson and her husband are making a grant to Mana Food. So all four of the nonprofits will be receiving support. And I think this says it all because we can be hopeful that we can address very serious challenges because of the partners and the generosity of our community. And so thank you so much for taking your time, spending time with us today, and we look forward to continuing this journey with you. Thank you so much.